Well, hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you today to our second virtual Note Investors Forum today, April 8th. And I'm really, I think this is really cool. There's, there's, there's a lot of things going on in the marketplace. There's a lot of questions going on in the marketplace in terms of where we're at, what's happening, and where we're going to go. But I want to make this two things. One, there are problems out there. I don't want to hide and put our put ourselves into the corner and say, whoops, we don't want to talk about the negative. I want to address that head on. That's one of the, the primary purposes of what we're doing today here. And also then, what are the solutions for that? So risk management, you know, how do you manage the, the challenges of a black swan event, which is what this is. But then and thirdly, and more importantly, what opportunities are here and when will they be coming coming forward you know when are we, when are, when are we going to see those and arlene did that did my screen switch over to the next slide yeah i tried to maximize it dave okay uh, dave just a heads up jeff uh, can't get in i guess the forum is full at this point say that again i'm sorry jeff peterson can't get in i guess the forum is full at this point. Uh, Arlene, can you help with that? Sure, let me, let me check. Uh, uh, Dave and Rico checking in. Good deal, thank you. Thank you. So to that yeah. point with everything, I guess, you know, there's my information there for moving forward. Uh, Dave, please, Dave. Please, yes. Dave, get, you got you get your mouth closer to the mic. Okay. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay. okay, good deal. So we're going to be talking about a lot of different things. It's all based upon experience. The five folks that are going to be talking, in addition to myself, they're very experienced. They've been around for a while. We've done a lot of research. Don't rely upon us. Don't try to game the market. But as usual, check with your own personal and business and legal advisor <clears throat> before you make any any real decisions. So. I don't want to focus just on notes. I do want to focus on the real estate market and the regu and the economic markets that are out there because I think it's really important to look at those. They all work together. Uh, I don't want to talk about the coronavirus as such. There's enough of that in the media. But what I do want to talk about is just putting how to handle this, put it together. And in the past, I've always sh sl uh, showed this slide here on collaborating okay. together. Go ahead. You're, you're sharing your email. How am I doing that? Okay. Is that better? That's better, Dave. Okay. All right. So I want to focus on, on, on positive but also understanding the negative and it's about sharing. So with the folks that we have on here, I utilize our experience, I think we can all learn from it. I think we can all learn from each other. I was on a, a video last, on a, on a webinar last night with Venus Cox Jones. She runs the Central Ohio RIA. I took my first real estate class with her dad in 1938. It's like, oh, and what I, what, she had an interesting, interesting thought. She said, I go into every deal right now with multiple exit strategies. What if we have another black swan event and another and another? What's my worst case scenario? How can I get out of it? So again, moving forward with positive energy on this, what do we do to facilitate that? And if you look at what, a, what is a black swan event or in, in terms of who's moving my cheese? You know, what's there? How do we handle this? And basically, how do we find the economic opportunity? So back in 2019, everybody thought, okay, we're jumping in 2020. We're good to go. No big deal. Jump over. The market's great. And then what happened after that? The black swan event. It's an unknown. So if you look at a black swan event, there was a, a statistician, uh, Nassim Talets, back in 07, he wrote the book. And basically, he, sa he said, things do happen. It could be bioterrorism. 
It could be artificial intelligence. It could be a hurricane. You name it. It's going to be there. You've got to be aware of that and plan for that. So if you look at the, again, as a mindset reset, a lot of people with coronavirus, they have a lot of anxiety. They're like all wrapped up in it. And it's, there's a lot of reality to it, needless to say. And it's stressful. It's overwhelming. But when it's all said and done, life will not be the same, but we will go on and we will thrive. And I want to, again, I keep repeating myself on this. It's all going to be fine. There's no sense in just getting wrapped up in everything and just, you know, hiding from it. There's another gentleman out there called Chad Carson. And I, I was on one of his calls and I thought this was really interesting. And it's the approach that I've been taking since I've been, a fa since I've been really been slapped by these different events over the last few decades. But if you look at naive optimism, you know, it's wishful thinking, all that, nothing, it just keep going on, it's no big deal, don't worry about it, and you're not grounded in reality. There's a friend of mine here in town who is like that, and he's, he works with a lot of agents, and it's, it's, it's a tough gig, it's like, dude, be, re, be real. So I'm looking at it as, it is out there, I do know that down the road, it's all gonna be good, there's a ton of money to be made, but it's about, you got to be brutally honest about what the short-term reality is. It is what it is. You can't change it. So my term, and I heard this from Jason Medley the other day, being cautiously aggressive. So it's kind of like you're, you're overwhelmed with all this stuff floating around you. You're peeking out. What's going on? What are we going to do? But I, it's, it, this is the reality of where we are. You can't hide from it. You can, you can see all the negative stuff in the newspapers and all the junk. I'm not even going to go there. But, I mean, this is where we started with, what, three weeks ago? Stay at home. It's like, really? Uh, this came out, though, yesterday. And this is about notes. So let's talk about notes a little bit. Mr. Cooper, it's a large servicing platform. 86,000 people. 2.5% of the servicers total customers are now in loss mitigation, big thing. I was talking to Howard. He was on a call last week. You can put your, your principal payments on the back end of your mortgage and not even worry about it. And there's a, there could be even a loophole there that you don't have to pay at all. So there's a lot of variables there in terms of notes, seller carry. What's the reality of that? What's that gonna mean for us down the road? It, it's a lot, just a lot of double messages out there. What do we do? So right now you look at the streets and they're empty. But then think about what's going to happen when we do get jump started. How's it going to go? Is it going to happen right away? I don't know about that. But you just can't stop a multi-trillion dollar economy and expect it to just jump up and just go like crazy. Just not going to happen. Chase, back in six, 2016, they put this out. It was an analysis of different businesses around the country. Now, think of all the businesses that are shut down now. They don't have any cash flow. Yeah, they're going to get their loans, maybe. Wells Fargo can't even accept them anymore in terms of the SBA loans and the CARE Act. But the average business, non-real estate business, only has a cash buffer of 27 days. In Phoenix, it's 25 days. In real estate, the average buffer is about 42 days. So how long does it take before this situation really impacts us? How many of those businesses are really going to open up down the road? You don't know that. There's a restaurant in New York City called Grammarly's. It's a big chain. He thought, the owner of that thought he was in Fat City four weeks ago. He's destitute now. He doesn't know what he's going to do. He's laid off these thousands of employees. What's he going to do? So it's what are we going to do? How does all this impact us? It's all about, it is about them. It is about us. But how is all of that negative garbage reality of life going to impact real estate? What's it going to do for property values? What's it going to do for notes? Every performing note I have now, I'm looking at them as potentially being non-performing. Think about that for a minute. Good pay history, phenomenal pay history. What happens? a gentleman on a note that I used to own in Houston, Jose Rivas. Spectacular pay history. Unbelievable pay history. He calls me up last week. I can't get a hold of the servicer. 
I want to make my payment, but I can't. My hours have been cut down to two hours a day. What do you do? The best I could do for him is to send an email with his letter from his, his employer stating that his hours have been cut because of what's going on. But that's a reality. Now, the party that bought the note from me, they were buying a good product, a very good product, and they're caught short. But this is just one example. Within a day of this hitting the, the news as far as everything been, been shut down, two or three of my other payers called the servicers to say, we need a loss mit package, loss mitigation package. So it's, it's there, it's a reality. So if you're, and then there's other folks, uh, Sam and I were talking about this the other day, and also John Keith. The non-QM market, meaning the non-qualified mortgage market, I think there's only one or, two, one or two lenders left lending. A week ago, one of them sold their whole portfolio at 80 cents, 80% 80 of unpaid balance. Another gentleman on LinkedIn contacted me there's a firm in California, non-QM, $200 million worth of loans. They're concerned. Their average FICA was 700 for all those loans. They were lending in California, Arizona, Nevada, Texas, and Florida. He wants to sell them. He hasn't come to terms with what's going on. He still wants to get par, meaning at face value. I said, dude, you're crazy. He said, I can't sell for less than 95 cents because I've only got a $10 million reserve or he's upside down. What does he do? But it all goes into everything we're talking about here. We have to be cognizant of that. But with that, what does that mean down the road? Tons of opportunity coming up. So there's a, always a silver lining out there or with every crisis, there's always an opportunity. You just have to look for it. So if you, here's the breakdown in terms of different states with these businesses in terms of what their average cash is in reserve. It's kind of scary when you think about it. And we're pretty much approaching up this 25 days. So as I said before, half of the businesses only have 27 days of cash, of cash in reserves. And labor intensive industries only have about 16 days. So think about what's labor intensive out there. There's a, fair, there's a lot. If you look at the market cycle, there, it's a it's really an interesting situation. And I'm going to reuse this particular graph. This is a graph of how the feelings go in a typical market cycle. And Kyle uh, Limperman in uh, Michigan shared this, but I thought it was really interesting. So I applied it to what I've experienced in my life. And like I said, I've gone through, I acknowledge being through recessions going back to 1980 with the bust of the Resolution Trust and then moving on from there, 1991, 08, or, 11, or 2001, and then 2008. But it's these, this emotional cycle is so much what it's really all about. And most people are here right now. It's like they're, they're wondering about what's going on, denying, denying it. I know I was on, a, on Justin Colby's call the other day, and he said that he's getting sellers now calling saying, hey, I want to look at this again, what you offered me. And they're, they're, they're not in denial anymore. It's like they're almost in the fear. <laughs> as, as you've referred to where, to where I'm coming from, in 1980, I didn't even know there was market cycles. And I just, I got creamed, absolutely creamed with the rust belt. I was, rust belt. I was living in Cincinnati. I was a landscape contractor. So I moved to Maine and followed that through until 1998, 1999, it started crashing. And it just devastated me. I was building and developing, just got wiped out. And then if you move on to the different cycles in, in terms of me, and I'm me, no different than you, we're all the same, just a little bit more scars, if you will, and I've had my share. You go back to 01 with the dot-com bust. So I just come out of doing direct sales and I went back in the real estate and I was flying building and developing out in Tone Upon Buckeye, buying five, splitting them up, selling, selling off individual houses and making a killing. Then it just stopped. But, and everybody said, oh, you can get out of this. You can do lease options. So I did that. But what happened? The knife kept falling. People walked away. You, you, you're selling a house for 212. You were in hard money. You refinance out to regular mortgages. You do, like I said, you do a lease option, you get some money, those people walk because the values drop. 
So what I sold out for 212, they eventually sold REO for 75. Homes that I sold for 333, made 100 grand on, sold REO for 110. So I felt those scars. I, I've experienced every one of these different pit, those pinpoints there on that. But what I found was at that time, I don't know if you've ever heard, any of you guys have ever heard of the name Jack Miller. Jack was an old guru going, he'd been through 11 recessions in his lifetime. He spoke in, I think it was Rio, Reno in 07. At that time he said, and I was crashing big time because I was going 11 months with no money. He said, work for government, manage government owned properties. So with that, I jumped into REO. But in the meantime, I was having all these creditors chasing me down. Seven foreclosures, the whole, the whole rhyme and the whole scenario. We've all been there. But working the REL, I found a, I saw a whole different scenario of what was going on. I was not fortunate enough. I was so wrapped up in selling REL. I didn't follow the trend of what Sam was doing or Justin was doing or these other guys. I was just working that market and it went, went well. But what I found was is that there's always a silver lining and look for the bottom. So then Vineyard was having a a Friday event and Chris Iman was there. This was in May of 2011. He said, the bottom is here. We're ready to go. But I was so involved in the REO, I didn't see the opportunity. I was so scarred from 08, I just didn't see it. Chris saw it, I didn't. I kept up with REO and it, it is what it is. But the bottom line is, you have to work with where you are. You could say, WTF, what's going on here? But it's like, really? So it's all different and it's all the same. It's all a black swan event. So we're here now. Tips in. Country's working through it. It looks like we're flattening out. That's all a good thing. So what I'd like to do, we're going to bring on a, a group of panelists now. And in terms of, I'd like to share a little bit. And Sam, you can help me as we go through and uh, help to introduce your guests. But bottom line, we've got several people here that can have a lot to offer. Enrico uh, De Agarza, he he's yeah. attending my meetup. How long have you been going for, Enrico? How long have you been attending for? Uh, how, have I, how long have I been in commercial? <laughs> You've been attending my meetup for how long? Maybe three years, four years? Oh, yeah. Months? Your meetup. Yeah, your meetup going back about three or four years. Okay. And Guillermo, well, I've, been, I've known you for what? Four going on five years now? The first two years you looked at me and you were wondering, who's this clown? Who's this guy? I think I attended the first meetup you had. Did you? Okay. I believe at the so. restaurant. Yep. Okay. And then Sam, we've known each other for what? Two years now? Yeah, I believe so. Okay, so you're, you're doing the wholesaling. You're really proficient at what you're doing. You're one of the monsters out there. And I mean that in an affectionate way. You. And you know what's going on. And then you introduced me to Jeff and Matt. And maybe you could share a little bit about, a little bit about them. Yeah, um, Matt, was Jeff able to get in? Um, I haven't seen, I haven't is, seen. Uh, is, your, is she watching the waiting room? I think it's probably some people might be getting backed up in the waiting room. But uh at any point, I was hoping Jeff would be able to make it on. Um, so Jeff, Matt, and myself formed a company recently called Smart Equity Investments. And Jeff is a banker, a hedge fund operator, and a builder who's currently developing quite a few projects. And my role in that organization is to uh, start the product. Um, we have a large team and we go direct to seller. We uh, primarily door knock. And I'm finding a lot of these opportunities. And I brought a few deals to the table recently where we are uh, in the city to build some ground up uh, multifamily developments. Um, also, in light of current events, uh, you know, Jeff was one of the guys in town that I sold a lot of properties to in the 08, 09 era. I was buying as many as 25 a day, and um, he operated one of those hedge funds, uh, held a couple thousand homes, and exited them you know, at the top of the market. And so we have quite a few things going on. So everything's changing on multiple levels. And I wanted to, um, Matt, uh, he's the other partner in our organization. He's an attorney and also a mortgage lender. And uh, Matt, I don't know if you wanna introduce yourself and also maybe comment, I think what maybe 
it might be of interest to hear what you, is going on in the lending world. I know uh, Dave referred to servicing and kind of what's going on there. And you had something you were talking about last week as well. Yeah, we can we can get into that. I'd like to just kind of run down this and and Jeff, what do you, okay, you guys, okay, so I understand where you're at. So what I'd like to do, Sam, if that's possible, is bring in Rico, and Rico, share a little bit about your background and you, you Guillermo and I had a call last week and you had mentioned that you're having some challenges and then I'd like everybody to jump in, in the retail side of the business in terms. And so as you go over this, I'd like all of us to jump in and just address the questions that are on the slide in terms of how do we evaluate managing the challenges the solutions, and then what are you going to do for the future? Just kind of, let's just kind of go through that. But Rico, if you could share with us, that would be great. Yeah, okay. Just to be brief, uh, I've been in construction, commercial development. Rico, just for, real, you have two devices oh, going on because we're getting quite a bit of echo with you. Yeah, there's some feedback there. Yeah, I don't know what to do. With Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Construction. I've been in construction development, commercial development for 30 plus years. Uh, my clients uh, all have residential and commercial properties, ranging from single family to multifamily, and and a lot of retail properties. Some of it's industrial. So we're all involved in uh, keeping tenants in properties and keeping them alive and well. Can you hear me? Okay. You're perfect. Okay, and. Uh, <clears throat> So the challenges and the, and, the, and the risk analysis things that we're facing with now is basically tenants, whether they're commercial or residential, they occupy property. And uh, depending on their own personal business or personal lifestyle conditions, uh, they are at various levels of risk and collapse. And a few are uh, doing well because they're in industries and businesses that are thriving. Uh, for example, just I'll just use a couple of examples. One tenant is involved in um, uh, uh, rehabbing uh, hospital facilities uh, uh, over over a large area of uh, Southern California and other surrounding states. His business has been booming for years and has no uh, no end to it. Um, on the other hand, some properties have restaurants and uh, uh, other typical retail kind of spaces. And they're all, you know, basically, uh, if they don't get the cash infusion soon, they're, you know, basically in a collapse mode. So um, that's what's happening out there. Um, and um, uh, retail properties that have reserves are basically counting the months of how many months they have of reserves left to be able to withstand the negative cash flow on holding their properties. And if they have a lot of leverage, leverage loans on the properties, then they're at higher risk. And if they have uh, uh, you know, no loans and no negative uh, uh, cash flow, then uh, they, got a, they can withstand a longer period of uh, floating through this, uh, this particular crisis. So um, the um, and in in in, 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 in 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 overall analysis of that, we look at the tenants that, that we're dealing with in these properties, and, and it all boils down whether it's a residential property or commercial property. It depends. The the risk analysis part of that is does your tenant? I mean, can your tenant withstand the 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 giant convulsion that's going on in the world? And, uh, and for a lot of reasons, some of them can, because they're well situated in industries and services that that will uh, float, uh, help them just float and ride right through it. And other people are just uh, are not going to be able to do it because the, there's nobody's looking for their product or services. So, so you had mentioned to me sorry, you know, that a number of folks well, they call part of that uh, we. Uh, we have all these uh, black swan events, but we don't, we don't really know what we don't know. We, there's all kinds of things in the world that can affect this, but the bottom line, if you, after you try to identify them all and you throw up your hands and say, oh, geez, I can't 
can't manage all of these things. I can't even think about all these things. But the one element that I I experienced myself about uh, trying to react to a black swan event is how is to, uh, fine tuning your skills into listening to what the market's doing. And I look back at this particular event that we're experiencing now, and I say, uh, well, if I uh, if I had only listened a little closer in January, early January, I could have reacted sooner, and uh, maybe I could have gone out and bought, uh, you know, a truckload of, uh, you know, 10 bundles of toilet paper, paper towels, and all the rest of that junk, and, um, and stocked up and been able to slide through this crisis a little smoother. But it's, so it's the listening I'm just saying it's the be, being aware and being able to listen to what's happening in the market, in the world, so you can react accordingly. Um, I remember back in 07 and 08, just going to be brief, that if I had listened a little better, uh, uh, I could have reacted sooner and I could have bailed out sooner and uh, saved uh, – Certainly, a lot of a lot of zeros, yeah, yeah. dollars and cents. So, um, I, the listening is a key element to this whole process of investing and listening to the market. And the other part of it is risk. You do have to do a certain kind of fine-tuned risk analysis to identify your, uh, you know, you're in bed with a tenant. You're in bed with a uh, you know, the, the company you just mentioned, who has 200 million in loans, and and all the all the financial scores were that was comfortable. Well, okay. but if they do it a quick, I bet if they did a little in more in more depth analysis of that, that some of those people, doctors and nurses and medical service people, are doing just fine. And they're probably going to do fine for the next 50 years, you know. But uh, the guy that's uh, selling uh, something else in the world, then maybe he's not going to do fine. And, maybe he, and he's your tenant someplace in the world. And let's face it, I mean, a piece of property is, rental property is uh, based on the tenant. That's the bottom line. So how are you going to manage the folks that are having challenges now? What what do you yeah so what do you decide to go uh, managing so the first step is that we're uh, reaching out to them and um well some, most of them are reaching out to us and uh asking for a reprieve on um not paying can you uh, forgive our rent or forgive a portion of our rent for this last month which we're all doing <coughs> we're saying okay uh, we'll give you half off and uh, half off the rent, and uh, we'll accept that half rent. And uh, uh, and we're looking at it. We're saying we're going to look at it on a weekly, monthly basis. So if the situation changes, we'll adopt it accordingly. We think. Uh, in addition to that, we're <clears throat> trying to be a little proactive and get tuned up on how to advise the tenants to get, to get money from the small business money loans so that we can help them get funded uh, from the government as opposed to just letting them flop around out there in the market and um, try to figure it out for themselves. I'm not involved in that particular aspect of it. So, um, other guys on our team are, but uh, we're, that's one of the proactive things we're doing. Okay. The other proactive thing we're doing is, of course, like probably any other investor, is trying to identify what kind of reserves you have and evaluate uh, the, the tenant mix and determine what, who's, who's failing, who's not going to survive, and um, – how many months? Uh, how many months of reserves do I have to continue to float the loans on these properties before I start going serious negative? So uh, that's a 
uh, a process that you have to uh, do a pretty in-depth uh, uh, analysis of, and then you go back and, and evaluate each property and determine, you know, they're all, they're closed, right? So there's, there's no tenants walking, minimal amount of tenants walking in and out of these properties if they're commercial. So you evaluate how many, how much money can I save by cutting back uh, on various types of maintenance and ongoing issues that you can afford to at least a cut back on for the moment or for the, for the period of time we're in this crisis. So these are the uh, kinds of issues that we're, we're approaching on how to save a property. Okay. So after you get done with saving, and would you look at yourself now, Rico, as an ender or still a builder? Uh, an so ender meaning that you've, you, you've built your portfolio and you're not going to expand upon it anymore. You're just going to write it out. Or after this is all said and done, are you still looking for other opportunities? And if so, what do you anticipate out of that? Uh, good, good, good question. And I'm going to uh, have a unique kind of answer to it. Um, I'll, I'll give you it like this. 20 some years ago, no, 30 some years, about 30 years ago, a, a, uh, a futurist economist by the name of Paul Zane Pilsner. Yes, yes. Wrote, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he wrote, he wrote a book and he's been around for a while. He basically predicted at the time that this convulsion, the con part of the convulsion that we're experiencing now in the retail market world was going to happen and it's actually happening big time right now and has been for several years. And he called it the cocooning, cocooning of America, meaning uh, that America and the, the, computer, the computerization of America was going to um, uh, prompt the, the individual buyer, like, you know, consumer to cocoon, withdraw from the big world and not want to go to shopping centers and malls and and want to just buy online and um, and uh, cocoon themselves their little world and into a level, into a level of pr protection so they can uh, just you know survive the convulsions of the world. So that's what we have see happening today. The long and the short of it, what I'm trying to say is that this has been going on for quite some time, and it's reaching a, a high point now. You look around, and you even see in this Phoenix area that uh, the the, that shopping mall that's like uh, uh, what is it Shea and uh, Shea and Tatum Paradise Valley Mall. I mean, if anybody's been there in a while, it's almost a ghost town. I mean, it's a huge facility, and uh, it's one of the biggest malls in, in the area. And it's like it's they, they can't they could barely even a lot of vacant spaces, and uh, they had to give away space to some major anchor tenants just to just to keep the place going, it's still a ghost town. It's a joke. So, um, maybe so, so that's happening. That's been happening. Yeah, uh, on a yeah. smaller scale, uh, same thing's happening with smaller, smaller retail centers. I mean, if your tenant, uh, if your tenant has a business that can, just by, by comparison, if your tenant has a business that can be, or a service that can be purchased online in the world someplace, then your tenant is at risk of being phased out and, and uh, becoming obsolete. So if you look at the malls today, they in the malls or the, the smaller retail malls, there are basically a lot of smaller tenants that have either something very unique, uh, service or product uh, offered, or their nail shops and you know restaurant kind of services and maybe H and R blocks and small finance companies and things like that. So you gotta be very selective about the tenant um, or be aware about the kind of selections you're, you're using with the tenant. The long and the short of it is that, <clears throat> that uh, uh, retail is at risk and has been at risk for 20 years. And um, uh, if you had it, if you had in my, in my world, in my thinking, if you had, uh, the uh, if you had a pile of cash and you wanted to invest it someplace, 
uh, in the safer place is not retail, it's in residential. And will be in residential, in my opinion, for some years and decades to come. Uh, because when things collapse, commercial is one of the hardest hit, first hardest hit spaces, because those people who own, who are tenants and of the small businesses and commercial, they retreat out of those spaces and retreat to their where? To their house. And they maintain their house. They don't maintain paying rent at a retail space when the economy collapses. They maintain their survival cocoon more than they do the retail space. Perfect. So, perfect. I don't know, maybe that answers your question. It does, it does. Guermo. Yes. Uh, you're, you're an ender now, so to speak. You're selling off what you bought in 08. You took advantage of what was going on then. You benefited from it. You profited from them. You helped a lot of people. You put them in housing. You had a lot of JV partnerships along the way, right? Yes. And now you're selling off and reaping the rewards. So as you look through, what kind of challenges are you having? And how are you, again, solving those challenges, evaluating them, and then... Are you looking for opportunities or are you just kind of let things wait? I know that you've always, you've also been evolving to notes in a big way, which is how we met. Maybe you could share for a few minutes on that, those basic thoughts. Sure. Yes. Well, as you know, Dave, I'm, I'm a big believer on the black swan effect. Um, and by the way, I was looking at it right now, according to the, the subtitle of the book, it's called the impact of the highly improbable. And that's a book written by uh, Nassim Talib, who's the guy that came up with this theory. And um, I made money by taking advantage of a black swan effect, which was the 08 collapse of the real estate market. Nobody saw it coming until it hit us and it hit us bad and et cetera, et cetera. And um, I was able to get property some pennies on the dollar, basically is what it amounts to. And, uh, and now I'm selling these properties. I, I, I held on to them, but I had a plan on how to handle the whole thing. Um, you know, somebody here was mentioning a few minutes ago, how do you anticipate a black swan effect? Uh, you can't. Um, black swan effects by definition are unpredictable. There, there is no way to predict for them. The, the only way that I have found that works for me is, um, is I adapted the investment principle of diversification. As it applies to real estate, what I mean is I have multiple unrelated, independent, as far separated as possible exit strategies on a, on a given property investment. Um, that way, the likelihood of everything, go, of all of them going wrong, while it is still is, exists, is minimized. Um, I try to you know, have in the, in the 08 crisis, for example, before that, before the crisis hit, I was doing fix and flips before that. And unlike everybody else, I stuck to my guns of only buying one property at a time. I would buy one property, fix it, flip it, and sell it. Yeah, some people were buying 20 and 30 properties a week and, and, and so forth. And when it hit, they were caught with 20 properties in their portfolio with hard money loans, and they couldn't, they couldn't maintain, they couldn't get rid of them, they got into serious trouble. I was left with one property. Well, dealing with one property is a lot easier than dealing with 20 properties, even though I had a hard money loan. I had multiple strategies for it. I did not try to sell it when the crisis hit. I still own that property as of right now, and uh, I turned it into a rental. And um, the rental barely covered my hard money payment at the time, but it avoided a more disastrous effect. So, so nowadays, what I look at is how do I, what's my risk? What are my exposures? What can possibly go wrong? And try to have extra strategies that address all the possible things I can think of. I don't care how unlikely they are. I look at scenarios as a, a war breaking out with North Korea. In, in an atomic attack happening in California, stuff like that, you know, yes, it sounds science fiction to some people until it happens. You know, um, back in 08, 
nobody thought, everybody said, you can't lose in real estate. Real estate is safe, it, it always goes up. Well, we learned the hard way, properties that were selling for $300,000 one month, next month we're selling for $30,000. So it didn't go down um, and, and things like that happened. So right now, my strategy right now is hold. I'm on hold. I've frozen everything. I'm waiting to time my entry back into the market uh, when, when I feel that if, if not the bottom, that we're close to the bottom, that we're on this bottom section of the of the marketplace to to to, to jump back in. Um, I've started seeing some signs of some, uh, uh, as you know, Dave. I'm I'm now into notes, and that's more of a practical reason and a lifestyle reason rather than an investment reason. But uh, in the note business, I've seen some people starting to become a little bit more negotiable, shall we say, um, in, into what they're asking for. Um, you know, we I've been trying to buy a note now since January and so forth. And um, no, before that, when was it? I forget when we started. Uh, maybe it was it was last year. And 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 people were asking ridiculous prices for for their for the notes. And that's fine. They were entitled to ask those prices. I was entitled not to buy them. So we didn't buy them. We moved on and we kept waiting and waiting. Now this happened. Could anybody predicted this? No, absolutely not. Nobody could have predicted this. But it is a black, that's what makes it a black swan effect. Mm. You know, it's kind of like winning the lottery or things like that. You know, it has tremendous consequences when it happens. So I'm waiting for that, uh, that market to turn. As of right now, um, all the properties that I own have paid rents um, this month. Uh, whether they'll pay rents next month, who knows? All of my tenants have their jobs. Uh, nobody has been laid off yet. I, I talked to all of them this um, this past couple of weeks. So I'm expecting rent next next month also. We'll see what happens. But I'm I'm ready to extend. The rest of the, if, if it came to that, I can hold on to those properties at least until December, if not January, with no rents. Okay, no, it won't be fun. No, it will, you know, it'll take quite a bit of adjustment, but, uh, but, I, but I won't be put in a desperate situation where I have to do something drastic. So, so um, my, my position right now is hold on and wait. I don't think it's gonna last that long, I think, um, I think probably in the June, July type frame, thing, things are going to start becoming more normal. And by August, September is probably where I, where, when I anticipate buying more notes. Yeah, yeah I agree. So, so can I respond to some of that? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Dave, can I, can I comment on some of that? Absolutely. Okay, so regarding predicting events, two thoughts. Uh, in 1990s, when Paul Zane Pilsner was talking about the cocooning of America and the collapse of the retail market, um, uh, we had just finished building out a bunch of retail properties. And we, we dismissed it, said, ah, baloney, no problem. Well, here we are today. And um, there were people talking about the collapse of the retail market 30 years ago. We didn't want to listen to that. We didn't want to listen to that. In addition to that, it's a different, pro different situation. Over the past 10 plus years, there's been several people, Bill Gates being one of them, and before even Bill Gates, talking about the impending uh, pandemics. Nobody wanted to listen to that. Here we are today. In conclusion, if you're investing in real estate, uh, it's a long-term investment, usually. But if you're not always, if you're looking to, you know, re to do the flip on the deal, it's not a long-term uh, investment. But it, it typically, in some cases, they are long-term investments. So you have to have long-term views. And you have to have long-term listening to be able to then structure your risk 
So you structure your risk. You don't just fall into the barrel call, I fell into the barrel of risk. You have to think about what the risks are, and then you have to plan, try to plan to avoid them. Well, most people don't, I think. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm guilty of that, of falling into that category, just suffering from the results of it. But um, you have to, if there's somebody's talking about a risk in the world, and uh, you can listen, you can, if you choose to listen to it, and then you have, you structure a long-term view, and then if you, if you structure a long-term view, you figure out if you're going to have to, if you're going to park the reserves to be able to withstand um, the kind of interruption and recession and crisis that could come from whatever the risks Perfect. are. Perfect. Perfect. That's it. Uh, I'd like to move on to Sam, Jeff, and Matt, and just you guys work it as a team in terms of the topics, what you're doing now, what you anticipate, what you what challenges you've seen. And I know that Sam, you've been you're still really aggressive right now. At least that's my interpretation. If you guys want to jump in and just kind of contribute to what we've been talking about, that'd be great. Yeah, my, I'm not going to talk very much. I did a real soft introduction. Uh, Jeff is now on. Um, you know, we're still out there. We're a wholesaler. We're buying direct deals. Uh, we can take positions to develop as well, and also um, mitigating through some of the positions we have currently. We had a commercial deal blow up in our face a little bit, but you know, it's still a great deal down the road. We're just actually circling on that. But, uh, um, you know, I just want to pass it off to uh, Jeff and then Matt, to, you know, and uh, again, Matt, Jeff is, uh, I, I gave that introduction and Matt is uh, also an attorney and uh, he's in mortgage banking. So. Before we go there, Sam, how, what are you doing as it relates to seller carry and offering those options to distressed sellers or just general sellers that are out there? If you could just, just tweak that a little bit. And well, if the deal has very little equity, that would be uh, our play. I'm less keen to do uh, sub subject to financing. I've done a lot of it. Um, right now, I kind of wait because uh, in 09, when we were buying a lot of these things and a lot of the funds are evaluating these on an income approach. Um, you know, I would also be selling some of these properties and creating paper and servicing it. And then I had a uh, private guy that would pick up my uh, non-conforming notes, basically buy them at par as they were all, you know, good value notes. Right. So we're not doing any much seller paper right now, but I, I see that coming. Okay. And Jeff and Matt, you guys have a broad range of experiences, whether it be the legal side, the debt equity side, the brokerage, the mortgage brokerage side. From your perspective, having been through these, because Matt, I'm guessing you were through the last cycle? Yes. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, Go ahead. this isn't a real black swan for me because I just got the value back in my house. And so I knew that something was going to happen. <laughs> okay. So if you guys can interact from what you see as it relates to also the NPN space or what could be NPN space, hedge funds divesting themselves, opportunities as it relates to that, just share some wisdom. Jeff, did you want to go? Is Jeff still on, Sam? Uh, yeah, it looks like it. Jeff, you're just on mute. If you're on your phone, if you have the app, you got to find the app and then unmute it that way. Dave, can your uh, assistant unmute him, possibly? Is he un in under his name? Yeah, it's no, it's the uh, last four of a phone number at the bottom, 7575. Okay. You got it? Yeah, I've unmuted it. Okay. All right. Okay, good. great. So I, in the downturn in the market, I mean, I formed a hedge fund, and we brought, um, and we, we climbed into the storm of the, you know, the eye of the storm, you know, when everybody was running for the hills we kind of steered the ship towards, you know, the highest tide. And I don't know that we're heading there, but I don't know that you should be afraid not to turn there. And the reality is, is the question that you asked about um, seller financing, things like that, we did a lot of that. And one of the things that we found to be very successful is, is that, um, you, you know, um, we did basically hybrid mortgage um, opportunities. I've been around banking for a long time and we bought um, an enormous amount of buy and hold properties. 
and we bought them with cash and then we ultimately disposed of them when the market, um, you know, when the gestation reached. And so we don't sit in those positions, but, you know, Sam, uh, Matt and I sit in some development opportunities. And so we look at that really cautiously because it's, I think it's kind of a, it's a really close balance of where, you know, I, I heard earlier about talking about market timing and things along that line. If you're a market timer, you're going to buy one day and one day only because you're going to see the bottom of the, of the river one day and then the rest is going to be either um, it was climbing down or climbing up. And I don't think that's a very good approach. You know, I believe in, in you know, cost analyzation, and that means that you have to kind of climb in towards the bottom of the bell, and then you have to kind of – and then you kind of climb out towards the top of it. And if you just look at cost averaging over the course of that, you'll have done very, very well. And that's kind of the reason the stock market – people get really super spooked um, when the market goes up and down on a daily basis. But if you look at the long-term effect of what being in the market is, it's not a spooky number. Um, and that's because people don't, um, you know, they don't get panicked. You know, everybody looks at the Dow and they pay attention to that. The Dow is comprised of two big stocks that move it the most. And that's Apple and United Healthcare. Those things represent almost like it's, it's a large percentage of the stock market. Um, and that's, so it's not really a good analysis. And I, and I use that to take a look at real estate and the statements that have been said is that if you look at it as a long-term, as a long-term play, you're going to be very, very well at it. But if you look at day over day, over day, over day like that, that's a pretty poor approach. And so what I would say is there's going to be those opportunities out there. And I agree wholeheartedly with the view and the outlook on commercial real estate. I don't know that those large big box retailers are going to, um, be back. I just don't. And I do believe that this window has shown people that um, teleconferencing and, and doing a lot of that stuff from home is not only going to be valuable to family, it's valuable to employers from a cost standpoint. Do I believe that I believe in a trickle down effect for real estate? And what I mean by that is, is that everybody's going to need a home. So your statement about it's ultimately going to fall, follow its way back to real estate. It is. And the people that live in a million dollar home that all of a sudden now have to move backwards, move to an 800 and the 800 moves to six and such and such and such. So wherever you trickle down to the bottom portion of that, that's where your healthiest level is going to be because at the end of the day, they, they, they've got to have a place to reside and they've got to have a place to raise their families. And that's the philosophy that we've always taken. So our positions in the multifamily space is being, what can we deliver as an end product that we'll know that there'll be an appetite for and don't be afraid to be doing it right now because I'll tell you what the appetite for it in six months is going to be strong potentially and definitely strong in 12 months and you'll be well positioned to deliver it. Now if you sit in the sidelines and wait for it, you're going to be caught and and it's not, and you're not going to have the opportunity that you would have had to do it another way. So long term, you're saying, Jeff, focus on the residential, back off on the retail commercial, and follow that path. Well, that yeah, yes and no. So um, there is commercial space that I think is still very desirable, and I'll tell you what it is. And that is anything that's in the manufacturing and the production side of business, because those businesses aren't going away. So like, yeah. So, for example, I own a I own a position in a large commercial um, warehouse and light industrial building, and they produce um, CBD oil. They're not going anywhere, right. and they're not and their production is not stopping. So those spaces are really going to be comfortable. There's other retail spaces that if you could attract and 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 we we heard one of the um, speakers talk a little bit earlier about uh, vetting your tenants. I would talk about those opportunities too. There's a lot of tenants out there that they're not going anywhere. You know, um, tax preparators aren't going anywhere. Attorneys are not going anywhere. Somebody that's selling li liquor, ammo, and guns, they're not going anywhere. They're going to be around. So those services that you actually tangibly have to go to, dry cleaners are not going anywhere. And ultimately, people are not going to stop going to restaurants. Even though there's a lot of services that deliver it to your home, it's still more expensive and people like the social outing. But are people going to go to Sears and JC Penney's and Macy's anymore? Most likely not. Are they going to bookstores to buy books? Most likely not. So the answer is yes. Um, shortly about that, but there, 
you know, people are still going to be going out to do some of those things. So those, if you can get massively distressed real estate um, opportunities in the commercial space, and you think that you're well positioned to be able to deliver tenants that are similar in things like that space, and it's not limited to those people, but it's, it's small little boutique shops and things like that. They're in trouble. They're in massive trouble. And I, I don't know that they're coming back maybe ever. And, um, but people are still going to head out and go to an urgent care facility when they need medical attention. And that is those, if those spaces can be gleaned for a very significant discount and you can put yourself in that position and then negotiate those tenants and leases, I would do it. And I agree with the gentleman from before. It's knowing who your tenant is and what that's going to be, because that is um, critical. You putting, um, a, uh, a, an entity that could easily be outsourced and outpaced by Amazon or somebody like that, you're putting yourself in harm's way. So basically just redefining your filters. Right. Agreed. I, I agree with him. Uh, all, all the properties that are we have that are uh, production manufacturing are solid and not even talking about having any hiccups in their business. Uh, and when you think about it, if, if you have a uh, small uh, retail, per, retail manufacturing space, that allows for an individual who's an entrepreneur to go do a startup business to make something that can be a thriving business. <clears throat> you can't do that in a retail space because it's not zoned for it. And uh, there's all kinds of restrictions around that. So, um, also, I would look at uh, the, the, I'll call it the morphing or the, the evolutionary change of some retail spaces that will just cease to become retail spaces and they'll become some other kind of uh, change of use kind of space. Okay. Um, so, Matt, you want to jump in as it relates to your experiences, either from a legal standpoint or from mortgage brokerage or share some of your wisdom? Sure. Um, I think the first thing is that I, I, I think it's a lot of people compare this to they're starting to compare it to the crash of, of, of 08, the housing crash. And I think it's completely different. Um, during that time, I mean, you had 30 to 40% of homeowners that frankly shouldn't have been owning homes. I mean, people were getting mortgages with 580 credit scores at a hundred percent and, you know, everybody deserves a home. But at the end of the day, if you, if you're, if you're running credit like that and not be able to put any money down, then at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're probably not in a position to be a homeowner. And when something does go awry, like back in 2008, you're going to have a big fall that affects everybody. I think, you know, what we're seeing is obviously we're seeing a lot of drop off in the service industry. Uh, you know, you had 10 million uh, unemployment claims in, in the last couple of weeks. And, uh, but, but like Jeff was mentioning, you have certain industries that, aren't being affected at all. Um, frankly, they're, they're booming. I, I think right now is, is, is as everybody navigates through this, I, I think the biggest thing is to look at it as a different animal and just kind of be patient. Uh, you know, there, there are going to be opportunities that, that present themselves as the gentleman was saying earlier. I mean, he's mentioning that he's, he's holding Pat until, till August and, and uh, I think that, that that's smart in regards to notes. I think other things, as Jeff was mentioning, you don't, you don't, uh, you know, the pig gets fat, the hog gets slaughtered. You don't want to sit on the fence too long or you're going to, you're going to miss out on, on some opportunities. I know in the lending side of things, because I, I, I'm still in the lending uh, arena, uh, I basically in the last two weeks had to relearn the entire mortgage industry because everything's changed parameters have changed, credit score qualifications have changed, the whole non-QM arena is just decimated, they're just gone. You have this forbearance thing that people don't quite understand, they think that it's automatically tacked to the back of their loan, where many times the forbearance is just something that's settled down the road for six months and they're still going to owe it, and that's going to cause a big rift. Um, you, the last administration had some criteria for forbearance. This administration doesn't. So at the end of the day, the whole, you know, I want mine attitude of the typical American, you get a lot of people that are going to do a forbearance that don't really need it. And that's going to crash the service industry. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, 
that's one of my biggest fears right now in the housing industry is the fact that, you know, there is no restrictions whatsoever. Anybody can just pick up the phone and get a, a forbearance, whether they understand the fact that they're still going to own that money or owe that money or not. It's not free money. It's not a gift. And many times it's not put on, on the back of the loan. It's something you have to, you know, get caught up shortly down the road. So I think that's going to cause a pretty big ripple effect in, in, in my industry and in, in the housing and lending industry, just, just that one point alone. So I, I think there's a lot of things to kind of take in right now. Um, I, I think it's, it's dangerous to say that this is like, you know, 9-11 or like, you know, 2008. I think it's very different. And I think we have to kind of be patient and, and, and take a look as, as things come down the line. I, I think everything that the speakers have said up to this point are, are very intelligent uh, observations and uh, to be followed to the T. Okay, and I want to bring out somebody else on. Go ahead. Dave, Dave yeah. can I say something, please? Yeah, go can ahead. I just respond to what you just said? Uh, let, let the, Doug, uh, I just heard last, just as an example. <clears throat> last night, some expert, medical expert was on TV and he said, at the beginning of this crisis the, the, in Wuhan, there's some 500 plus thousand people exited China to travel throughout the world for safe haven. Okay, now I'm not talking about this in a medical sense, but <clears throat> the, we analyze our, we look at our world, our investment world in the box that we live in sometimes at a failure and un, don't re yet recognize the opportunity that exists from those in other countries and other worlds that will, ex will flee their uh, collapsing world to find safe haven here. And what we sometimes think is like, you know, a big risk and a problem, well, they're looking at it like, what an opportunity. They could fly into America and buy something, whatever, because it's a safe place. I mean, when you, some people will pay extra money just to be not where they're at, you know, from some other place. I don't care if it's more money. I'm going to buy it because I got the cash and, you know, it's safe and my family and my entourage of families will be able to park ourselves here and survive the, sh the storm. So that's all I got. Okay. Well, hey Dave, I just wanted to clarify a point. Um, uh, when I talked about um, uh, that I'm holding down pad into August and so forth, I wasn't talking about um, timing the market uh, in the traditional concept. Um, uh, I don't believe in time in the market, but I do believe in timing the cycle in the market. Um, in other words, um, I don't think anybody on their right mind would have gone in in, uh, in uh, bought properties in um, late 2008, uh, for example, uh, when when it was obvious that there was a, a problem there. Uh, right now, uh, I was able to go in and buy once I saw the the, the curve turn around. And I use a mathematical model that I developed uh, to track it. Uh, and uh, you cannot time it uh, to, to the day, week, or even month necessarily, but you can time it to where in the market are we? What's the market reacting to? And, and that's what I mean. You know, I don't know if August is the right number. That's my feeling right now. That's a guesstimate at best. Um, it could be June. It could be end of May. It could be all the way to November. Who knows? But, uh, but, uh, since I have very limited funds, I'm a small time investor. I don't have a, a, a big uh, fund of money sitting there waiting to be invested. Um, I, need, I need to make every opportunity count. Uh, I don't have, uh, I'm not a Gatling gun. I'm a single shot uh, gun. So I need to shoot one at a time and make sure I hit the target every time. And, and that's why uh, I play the market the way I do it. And, and it's worked for me. So, you know, uh, also what other what another person just said a few minutes ago, I think that a lot of people have compared this to previous um, previous down cycles. And there's a fundamental difference that I keep trying to point out. All, all the other cycles were um, cycles that were financial cycles at its core. Um, the most recent one, the 2008 and so forth. Uh, or the dot com era, which uh, money was being uh, bought into, invested into prop into uh, 
new companies that didn't weren't going to make money had no prospects of ever making money. But um, this one is, is is fundamentally different. It has nothing to do with financials. It has nothing to do with anything, and it's affecting every single segment of society whatsoever. You know, uh, uh, the only ones that are getting positive effects out of this are yes, the healthcare industry, and the um, and related to that because of the needs for it. But everyone else is in in trouble, and it's not a financial solution. You cannot. Uh, fix it by finances. Uh, we have to work our way through it. The virus has to get under control, and then we have to get production back going. And that's that's when that's when this will be over. When production and the markets start opening up again, and, and the normal commerce starts uh, recuperating. Not until then. So I think that that's a fundamental thing to look at. When will that be happening? If not, they can throw in however many trillions of dollars they want into it. It won't make a difference into into the markets um, are back functioning again. That that has to happen first. Okay, hey Dave, this is yeah. Rodney. Yes. Hey, uh, the big difference between two thousand six and where we are now is the interest rates. The two thousand six, the name of the game was what's the price for the the house? What's the price for this? What's the price and how the price escalates and you make your money on price. The modern housing industry, which we're going to come in to right after this recession thing, is such low, huge interest rates that a modern kid doesn't ask, what's it cost for a car? He's saying, what's my payment? The same thing's true of the new era we're going to be in is, what's my payment? Housing will come back because... In 2006, if it, let's say the same house is in 2020, they're both the same price, but one $600 less a month in payments. So when it comes back and the interest rates are so blooming cheap, you're still going to be able to buy huge houses for a low payment. Well, payment's so, always been the name of the game, has it, Rodney? And a lot of, even in, especially in the car world. Dave, just on that topic, the demand versus the inventory now is is way different as well. I mean, we, we went into this thing with very little inventory, a huge demand. People are making 10 offers on, on every house. They were bidding, bidding above. Uh, I think that's going to help tremendously. I mean, back in, in the housing crash, you had builders that were way, way, way ahead of the demand. They were just building, 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 laying down plots. I mean, they learned their lesson. They, if you, I mean, they still haven't come back. They're still not building anywhere close than they, they used to. So I, I think it's going to help tremendously. The fact is that there's a huge demand of people that need housing right now, virus or no virus. And right. when right. it gets turned What's around. What's really happening is people <laughs> I talk to can sell anything they have that can come out at a reasonable payment. In other words, with the interest rate so low, you know, it may be three, four, five hundred thousand dollars, but the payment is so low that, you know, there will always be a market for people that can have afford the payment. Yep. And so, and they really don't care what the price is. I mean, we, we, you saw them do that with the cars. All of a sudden there were four year loans. Now there's seven and eight year car loans just because the payment stays the same. Yeah. I'd like to bring something else. There was a question on the board. I don't know who 17576 is, but it was a great question. The question was in redefining filters, bringing that to a granular level, how would you redefine your acquisition filters for notes, real estate? So I'm gonna address that question I had a, Dan Malcolm was on a call. He's a sales manager at FNAC, First National Bank of America. They're in Lansing. They're a huge wholesale buyer of, no, of seller finance notes around the country. So I, I sent an email to one of his broker acquisition persons a couple of days ago, and she responded back, and I'll get to that. And then I spoke with him this morning. And my question was, is what are you folks doing now for your buy box? What are your filters? What are you, what's your, what are you looking at? And, and I mentioned the email that Hannah Gingery had sent me. He said, we sent that email out before the, uh, the coronavirus, but basically they excluded the following states they're not buying in. 
California, Illinois, New Jersey, Nevada, New York, Ohio, and Washington. Non-coronet related out of the box. Minimum equity, 20%. And if the FICO is under 600, then the minimum equity, 30%. And if it was that, with the amortization to be under 20 years. And there, I buy predominantly from hedge funds and off of tapes. And to that point, I cannot, they will not allow me to call the payer. That's just not in the game. When you're buying one-off notes, you can talk to the payer. That's the last piece of your due diligence. <laughs> so they're requiring interviews on the payers every single time. And their questions are related around their work, their income, and just where are they in this whole scenario? They want to cover themselves. The other thing he said was a maximum of 70% ITV, investment to value. My buy box before all this stuff hit was conservative and I got knocked for that. Meaning that my buy box was no more than 60 or 65% LTV and less than 60% investment to value. Not knowing where values are going. So to that point, I'm really happy that I did that. But also I found that my, my buying clientele, the people that are buying the one-off notes for their IRAs, they like that security blanket. Because the IRAs, that's their bastion, that's their retirement. It also as part of Dan's conversation, I thought this was really interesting. They have 250 employees in the side of a week they all went virtual and they handled it seamlessly. So my question was, is what does that do? And I'm not looking for an answer, but I think we've already answered it to the commercial space that's out there as these companies find that they can do virtual. That like Zoom going from 10 million users to 100 million users, users inside of a month. That speaks volumes about where things are going. Uh, so basically he's saying we're still buying. It's just gonna be very, very conservative. So is Justin so on and also Eric Johnson? Um, let's start with Eric. You there? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So Eric, you and I go back to 2011 or 10. You helped me with some asset protection. And then we've been touching base back and forth when I was doing the REO stuff with Fannie Mae. You're down in Tampa. You do rentals, you're a mortgage broker, you do hard money lending. Talk to us. Yeah, yes, yes, that's all the above. I've got kind of the uh, one of the last seats on the table as, as to being a traditional mortgage broker. I mean, there's a few of us around, but but not a lot. And uh, <clears throat> I do the, the full gamut from uh, government and conventional paper on through uh, what used to be the non-QM, which as, as Matt said, that's that's not really a game at the moment, but I think it's going to come back. And then, of course, the private money lending, too. And then I manage about 30 doors between for some investors and a couple for myself also. So I... I I see this this whole circus from from every angle here. Um, so, do you call yourself aggressively conservative or aggressively uh, active right now? Yeah, I, I would say conservative, but you know, the, the, the conversation kind of flipped around timing and so forth. And I, I've always looked at myself as uh, as timing the opportunities, and regardless of what the market cycle is, there's always going to be opportunities. And uh, you know, whether whether the market's at the high cycle or at the low cycle, there's always going to be something that really makes a lot of sense. And um, I, I've always been one to really filter out carefully, you know, first and foremost, positive cash flow on everything that we, that we purchase or anything that we get our investors into. And I've always been fairly conservative on the LTVs, even when the, the market of late for the past couple of years, I see a lot of these, you know, hedge fund portfolios doing loans based on after repair value and so forth, and even funding the, the repair costs and some of these, these flip deals. And I've just held... I've held to a, a pretty strict uh, 70 to 80% max on, on acquisition price, not, not ARV uh, for, for our private money lenders that we're doing business with. And um, even now I'm pretty comfortable at a 70% um, of, of acquisition price. Uh, and, and hopefully there's some, some extra room on the upside uh, on top of that. Yeah. Uh, um, as far as rents, rents go, I, I managed 30 doors and uh, I, I fortunately, we've, we've only got a couple of tenants, a couple of were behind 
before this happened and they were on the way out anyway. So they, 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 of course, their situation was exacerbated with what's been going on. Uh, but it's really forced me to really be much more cognizant of the kind of tenants that we're getting into properties too. And I'm going to be screening for like no food service, for example, no, uh, uh, you know, n none of these you know, recession prone kind of, uh, kind of, kind of possible tenants going forward. Okay. okay. Perfect. Perfect. And Justin, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Okay. So you're an indie, you're a yep. no guy. I'm going to ask you a half empty question. Okay. All right. Okay. Your, your indie is a really strong town. But you're you're investing yeah. all over the country, right? Yeah, mainly Midwest and Southern states. Okay, so this is a I'm baiting you with this question. Okay. And you know the guy that asked it. You you met him at the noteworthy event. Okay. What will you do in the event of a severe turndown? How will you do that with your note business? And knowing, it, let's assume that that happens, or assume it's not. How are you adjusting your buy box on notes? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, if, if something catastrophic continues to happen, there's nothing really any of us can do except hold on, right? Um, right now, my buy box, like everyone else's, is kind of conservative. Interesting though, I had a seller that um, immediately when the COVID-19 started coming out into the U.S. and people started to get quarantined, he's wanting to sell off uh, quite a bit of his loans. And I made some concessions with him and said, I'm interested in this tape. You know, are you willing to entertain the idea of um, holding back a couple of payments before I buy this? Partial. So no, holding back more or less a couple of mortgage payments. I'm like, okay what's the situation if April and May don't get paid, you know, I'll, I'll consider using my normal parameters of buying so much, you know, cents on the dollar ITV. Um, but would you consider holding back a couple of payments um, so that, well, I'm sorry, not holding back, but making those payments for me if the borrowers okay. don't pay and the sellers, the seller was willing to do that. They were willing to entertain that. So I thought that was very interesting. So it told me a lot that people that are uh, more or less the rookies in the business, um, they're definitely willing to, to sell their paper and they're, they're willing to sell it for a little bit better of a discount than normal. I thought that was interesting. So um, my buy box is a little, is a little conservative as well, but also if the opportunity presents itself, I'm all over it. Yeah. What I'm seeing more is uh, not real estate and more or less changing and, and going down, but more or less borrowers needing help getting into the house, needing lending. And so that's a big push for me in 2020 before the coronavirus even came into effect and it's becoming more prevalent. Even this week I've had two deals come across my desk to where the borrower wants to buy a house, but they can't buy it because they don't have the cash to buy it, nor can they get bank financing. So um, lending right now is going to be a, an amazing opportunity um, for people looking for passive income going to the outside of, when this pandemic kind of tapers off. So there was a question from one of the folks online. Yep. I know I'm going to answer it after you do. Do you think performing notes will emerge when this is all over as being worth more at par or less? Um, I don't know how to answer that question because I don't really buy anything at par or sell anything at par. So let's assume your buy box. Yeah. And you're buying five months from now. Yep. And some of those folks had to go <clears> through loss of it because they lost their job or their income stream. Yeah. But you know, they're good payers because of what they did in the past. How would right. you approach that? If you would normally buy well, I'm before this happened, I was buying at some pools that I'm performing at 40, 45%. Yep. Okay you might be buying at 35% or 65%. <clears throat> How would you evaluate those with your filters, knowing that they're back on track, but they had that blip. So it's kind of a reperformer, but. Yeah. yeah you kind you kind of have to put your blinders on right now because it is what it is. Most, uh, you know, people are affected in some way, shape or form with, with, you know, the coronavirus. 
you know, either they lost their job or they lost income or lost opportunity. But the fact of the matter is I was checking our portfolio and several of our investors portfolio. Not a lot's changed. Um, I was kind of surprised. I thought I'd see more missed payments, but a lot of people were making their payments. So somehow they're coming up with money and putting it towards their mortgage payment. So um, I guess I would say if I'm looking at a tape in the future and buying it, I would kind of put my blinders on a little bit with some of the stuff based on the, the pay history before Corona and after, you know, the pandemic kind of washes away. And I would just, you know, and when you're in the note business, it's a gamble anyway, so to speak, you know, you look at a pay history and you see the story, but you, you're not going to know what's going to happen in the future. But if you're buying at the right price, cause real estate's really not going to, I don't believe real estate's going to drop that much right now. It's pretty resilient. Um, you know, you're just protected by the real property. If you buy it right. If you buy the note right. Yeah. 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 Dwayne, are you unmuted or I unmuted you? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. So you're an ex, you're an ex Buckeye. Yeah. Now you're down in Florida. Yeah. And you're echoing. Can you get closer to your mic? Sure. <laughs> so what are you, let me, let me pose this one. I got a call from a guy today. He has a note in Yuma. Arizona, which is Southwest Arizona, mm -hmm. desert area, farming, heavily Hispanic. And it's in the middle of downtown, commercial, retail. The unpaid balance is seven figures. It's half empty, historic district. Could you market that? And if, would you even try? Well, I'm, I'm not really a player in the commercial space, so I guess... Uh, Let's just look at it as a note. It's just a note. It yeah. Is. Well, I mean, if it is retail, as has been mentioned before, that's that space is a little bit uh, unique, especially with the, you know, Amazon and, you know, malls closing up and that type of stuff. So if that it would you'd have to have a pretty good discount, I think, to go in and touch that uh, commercial space. Uh, Again, I, I don't play in that market, so I'm probably not the best person to speak on that. But uh, I, I think, I mean, there's always a market if you can get the price at the right uh, at the right place. But, you know, obviously, the owners always think it's worth more than it is, at least from my real estate experience. Uh, so it, it might be a tough sale. Okay. Okay. What are, you, what are you focusing on now? Are you doing a lot in the note space? Are you just sitting back and watch and servicing what you got or... You know, I, I, I actually, we're just uh, ready to move from Naples. We're moving up to the villages in Florida. So I've had to sell, I sold off my rental properties down here in Naples. Uh, so the last three or four months I've been doing up and but fixing those up and, and, and getting them sold and uh, closing on the last one tomorrow. Um, but uh, so I haven't really done any buying uh, and, and, and probably so it was timing was probably good now that with the virus and stuff hitting. Uh, so I'm going to sit back probably for another couple months and watch the market, see, if, see how bad it goes. Uh, I don't think we've hit the bottom of the note market yet. Uh, I think you'll, you'll, you know, customers will still get panicky and start selling it cheaper probably than even what they are today. So I'm going to sit back for a couple more months and watch it. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. So I think, I think I'm going to wrap this up now or five minutes to the hour, but I'd like to close with this. I think in the note world, we're going to see some great opportunities coming up in the next two, three months. It's going to take a while to filter out to what degree. I don't know. I also think based upon talking to a few hedge fund folks and people that market pools and thousands and thousands of notes that we're going to see some great opportunities coming. So I don't look at, Right now, it might be a little bit painful, but I see a tremendous buying opportunity in terms of buying large pools in, in, in its own way, replicating what was in 10 or 11. Maybe not that severe discount, but the opportunities being there, whether it be the non-QM stuff or whatever. So I, I really feel that keeping your powder dry, creating relationships for one offs, two offs, 10 offs, 50 offs, whatever is going to be the way to go. But again, having a strong filter, never knowing what's going to happen to protect your investor. That's just, that's just my sense. So with that, if does anybody else have anything to add? 
And if you can send me an email or a text in the chat box, I think I pretty much covered everything. I don't want to overstay our stay. Okay, good to go. Okay, so I'd like to thank you for being here. Uh, we talked about that. And this is this last slide came from Azria, the local real estate investment club. This pertains to Phoenix. And I think it's, it's what others have been saying here too. So it's a question, now again, this is Phoenix, it's a whole different market than other places. But I think it's very, very real. So again, looking for the lemonade in the lemons and what, wherever you might be with that. So other than that, that's really all I have to say, but I still think there's gonna be a, a, a wealth transfer and there's a lot of opportunity. I know I'm speaking to Sam and I wanna unmute you for one second if I could. You still there, Sam, or not? Yeah, I'm here. I just uh, left my desktop running. Okay. What was the question? I just jumped on. I haven't been on for about 15 minutes. Okay. I just, I'm looking for a close for the Phoenix real estate market in two minutes. A close? Yeah, you, you know, close. Oh, oh boy, that's pressure. Okay. As it relates to notes here, notes nationally, just based upon your experience. You know, Dave, I don't know how much I have to say about that. I, I can tell you, though, that it is it was a lifesaver for me in the last downturn. Um, as I was buying stuff that I couldn't exit and sell, um, I was selling a lot to Hispanic families that had cash, and we were doing the paper. Um, you know, basically, I was either selling to that kind of a buyer or to the hedge fund. And, uh, you know, we're positioned well if, that, if it does go to that point. And, we also do a lot of creative finance deals too. When we get leads come in that are don't have the equity spread that makes sense for a flip, uh, you know, we'll do. Uh, you know, if any of you are familiar with Sean Terry, but a, a version of his down payment uh, arbitrage, where basically you just uh, you have a second on there, you can work to negotiate it, uh, find a buyer with money, give the seller a little bit of cash, you know, various different versions of that. Um, and we do do quite a few subject to deals now as well. So um, I also hear, I guess, the other thing that I can speak to as far as that goes is I do hear a lot of whispers of banks, uh, you know, they can't foreclose, but especially on the commercial side already, they're starting to take uh, names and numbers of who, what the appetite is to move some of these notes on some of those assets that were discussed earlier. So we will uh, wait and see. We've actually got, we're proofing up with some funds with a connection now that's working with about 25, um, you know, conventional or conforming lenders on the commercial side. So. Okay, perfect, perfect. So I'd like to thank our speakers, uh, Guermo, Enrico, Matt, Jeff, Eric, Rodney, Justin, Dwayne, all good, appreciate it. And I don't want to close with this phrase, Harvey McKay, is a long time. Long time. We had, uh, yeah, we already had some rents that we were in the process of. Uh, get his emails all the time. He just put out a book and it's titled, You Haven't Hit Your Peak Yet. It's on audio, it's phenomenal. So let's close with this. You haven't hit your peak yet. It's still there. Go get it. And there, we'll have another one. There'll be another Note Investors Forum meeting virtual in the next couple of weeks. I haven't scheduled it yet. You all will be on the email chain, and I'd love to have you guys jump in. And I appreciate it. Appreciate all of you. Thank you.